Alright, um, so this is the last lecture in which I'm going to teach you things. Hooray! End of semester. Great. Um, aside from the last one, we'll, we might actually, if, if you guys are interested, um, so obviously we've got, we've got the quiz, quiz next week. Um, the last lecture, I normally do sort of a study review thing, and so we'll go through a couple of the ideas. I think you mostly should be across it, you know what's expected of you for this subject. I mean, I keep telling you enough times. Um, well, what I thought we might actually do is maybe share some study techniques uh, and start to plan out how you might study for the exam for this subject. Uh, and see so if you guys have some ideas, I'll give you some of my ideas, um, and we can have a bit of a discussion like that if, if you think that would be useful. Um, if you don't think that would be useful, feel free to maybe not to rock up and then we can all have a rest of it. Um, I, think, I think because it's a, a relatively complex subject, uh, and to pass the difficult questions, you need to have a fairly deep understanding. So it's not just a matter of repeating the tutorials and looking over my lecture slides and things like that. You need to get it a bit deeper level. So if we talk about some techniques to actually achieve that, uh, that might be useful for this subject and other subjects for that matter. So um, that's, that's my plan for that last lecture. So I won't be really teaching you much, um, but we can plan out what you actually want to do. Do you know what the exam for this subject is yet? Yes. Last day. Last day of exams, well, second month. Alright, well that's pretty good, you've got plenty of time to study for that then. Um, so, uh, you'll, you'll obviously need to manage out your study period, don't leave it until the last two days to study for this one. Um, you know, I talked about an EG 1000, so plan it to do it properly. This exam period is probably going to be tougher than the last ones that you've been familiar with, uh, and it will keep going in that direction until you get to last you know, your final year when you start getting bigger assignment based and, and less exams. Um, but this one's, this one's probably going to be quite complex for you, so plenty of time wisely. Alright, uh, let's get into it. Um, so, uh, we did any calculated force on a year um, yesterday, and <coughs> what's left today is how you calculate stress on a year. Um, now, the first equations that I give you, I will not be asking you to use. The reason that I'm giving you these equations is because this is where the actual stress equation that you use for gears has come from. So this is, this is kind of steps on the way to deriving it, and you can start to understand where that's actually come from. So it's context. Um, and Wilfred Lewis in 1892, so that tells you how long this sort of gear profile's been around, is the one, this first equation that I came up, that, I, that I've got on these slides, he was the one that actually published that and derived it and came up with it. Alright, so 1892, that's when we had involute steel guillotine that they were starting to do stress analysis on. So that's, you know, that's pretty good. Um, and the way that we actually do it is that we assume that we have a force, so the worst case scenario for a guillotine is going to be a force right on the very end. So imagine this thing is a beam standing up there. The worst force is the largest cantilever right on the end there. Um, the other thing, and one of the assumptions that we'll put into these analyses, is no load sharing. So we know full well that gear teeth, teeth you normally have a couple of teeth in mesh with one another, and so that force that we calculated yesterday would technically be distributed over two teeth. But that might be a tiny little bit on the tooth that's just touching and a lot on the tooth that's got its whole face on there. Or it might be, you know, one third across three teeth or whatever. We don't really, it, it's going to be changing throughout the entire mesh process. And so the most conservative and the most sensible thing that we can do is just say that that load carries through one single tooth. Uh, and if that tooth isn't going to fail, then we can decrease that load by sharing it across a couple of teeth. You know full well that that's not going to fail either. So a couple of major assumptions we make with the stress is that the force is at the end and that it's only applied to a single tooth. Now, if you are a Ford Motor Company and you're trying to save weight and you're trying to save sizes and all that sort of stuff, then maybe you do a much more sophisticated analysis based on what you actually know about you know, distributing load and things like that, finding all analysis, that kind of thing. You might actually save yourself a bit of weight material costs and things like that. But uh, for the context of what we're talking about, this is a perfectly fine uh, assumption. Now, we know that our force is broken up into tangential and radial components. Aside from the fact that that radial component will potentially cause some sort of a compressive stress, technically that radial component, you don't actually have any force on the top face of that. It's kind of on the front face of this. 
and it would be through friction that it causes that ra radial component. Um, and so we're going to ignore the radial component from a stress standpoint. Um, at the very end of this lecture, I've got a reference to where you start talking about surface fatigue of gear teeth. The gear teeth are much more likely to wear than they are to break if you design them right. And so it's the wear that you need to calculate. And there's a whole chapter in your textbook and uh, lecture that I gave you online version of um, talking about that type of stuff. So that's an additional analysis that you need to do with this. This is just the basic stress stuff. Um, and the basic stress stuff, we'll talk about that tangential component and we'll forget about the radial component. Okay? Um, the width of our tooth is V and we're assuming once again that we have perfect distribution across the entire width of the tooth. Okay? And if you have poor alignment, obviously that will go like that and that will be a peak load. All of that force through a very, very small area and that starts to become very critical. Um, and either you'll knock your tooth off or you'll get a very localised wearing failure there and then you'll have a lot of gear chatter by the time you've worn that face down. Okay? So, these assumptions kind of dictate the, the accuracies that you then specify in the manufacturing process. Alright, uh, and the last thing that we need to talk about before I move on, I've got some geometries here, different, you know, height and T and X and things like that, I'll talk about them. Um, but effectively, the way that this Lewis guy analysed the tooth was to use what is a very interesting property of a parabola and what's called a constant strength parabola. And I've done a little just Excel calculation here, and you can do it as well. Here's a parabola, it's just a simple one, y equals x squared. And if I treat that as a beam, if I treated that like my gear tooth, my gear tooth isn't a parabola because it's that involute or whatever, but if it were, and if I stuck an f on the end there, all right, you could take any section up there, and now with your a uh, very good grasp of bending stress, you'd be able to work out what the bending stress at the, at the tip was, right? Because you've got a force, you've got a cantilever distance, you've got a profile, which is a rectangle, and it doesn't matter that this is a parabola, your um, stress equals mc on i, and your i being 1 on 12 bh cubed. That all still applies because it's that rectangular cross section, right? So it doesn't matter that it's increasing. And so what we can actually do is at different sections we can calculate what the stress was. And the stress being right at that tip because obviously with bending as this tooth bends over, you're going to have compression on this side and you're going to have tension on this side exactly the same as if that was just a rectangular beam down there like that. Okay? And so we can calculate that. And I've done that in Excel and you can do that in Excel too if you wanted. This is just our lever arm, so obviously that's 9 units, whatever that is. Um, I've assumed that it's V equals 1, so it's 1 thick. And then our moment is just the force times the lever arm, so this would be 1F, 2F, 3F, 4F, etc. That's what I've got. C, C is our distance from the neutral plane in bending to the outer face. And in this case, I've used this distance, so the neutral plane is the centre, and I've just used the distance as I go out there. So that's these numbers. H is just double O's, obviously, because H is the full width of the rectangle. So now if I have H as the full width and B as the full depth, 1 on 12, this one times that one cubed gives me I. And my stress is MC on I. And let's have a look at the stress. Yeah, that's why it's called a constant strain, uh, constant strength parabola, because when you put a bending force on the end of a parabola, the stress throughout the entire section of the parabola, the bending stress, is constant all the way down. It's one of those neat kind of geometric properties of a parabola. All right, so it doesn't matter how far along the parabola you go, you get exactly the same stress, which is kind of nice. And if our gear teeth were para parabolic. <coughs> Um, that would be really useful, but they're not. Funnily enough, we can fit inside our little in-the-loop kind of profile, we can fit a parabola. And also, funnily enough, the point where if we make that parabola as big as is humanly possible, the point where the parabola actually touches the gear tooth is down here very, very close to that fillet radius where we're going to have a critical point anyway. 
And so what that tells us is if this was parabolic, we'd have constant stress everywhere. But as it is, we have some reinforcing, more material, less stress down here, more material, less stress up here, and so we know full well that the critical zone is going to be here because if I had less material everywhere, it would be everywhere, but because I've reinforced everywhere other than that point where the parabola touches the outside of the gear tooth, that's where the critical stress is. So, it doesn't matter that I've got reinforcing here, if I analyse what the stress on the parabola is, that gives me the stress at the point where that parabola hits the gear tooth. Is everyone on board with that? That's the assumption or that's the process that, that he made. He identified that a parabola will fit inside that involute gear tooth and if he analyse the parabola that hits the, the narrowest point of the gear tooth anyway. Um, and if you calculate. So that's what he did. And then that turns our gear tooth into a very simple little beam that if we know a couple of those geometric properties we can calculate what the stress is, which is great. And that's exactly what he did. Alright, and so um, you just calculate sigma equals mc on i, and if you have some properties, so ft is our tangential force, uh, we're looking for hb and t, and so h is the exact height, uh, b is the depth of the tooth, and t is the width of the parabola where the parabola actually hits the gear tooth. And if we knew those things, we can calculate what the stress is. And for our particular example, um, let's just use let's use this, the very longest or the base of that, if it's nine whatever units long, then we have H equals nine, B equals one, because that's what we chose, T equals six, because this is six wide when that's nine high. And then if I put that value into those equations, I get sigma equals 1.5. Ft, which is what I just proved to you that that's what that parabola stress is. Okay, so it's exactly the same as the equation I just used. It's just kind of a reformulation of that based on gear tooth geometries. Now we don't know really what we do, but it would be a real pain in the ass if we had to calculate h and t for every single gear tooth. So that's the height of the gear tooth, the width of the gear tooth. So the other thing that this Lewis <coughs> guy did was to simplify those parameters into a nice graph that once you know the characteristic, so your, your dimensional pitch um, or your, your module or whatever of the, of the actual gear tooth, then you can just read from the table straight and get the stress rather than have to actually know what those sizes are. And so firstly he did a little, you know, you can, you can look back at the calculations, but he did this little relationship between constant triangles, so t on 2 and x, so I used this property x and t on 2 and the relationship between that triangle and this triangle the same. So we introduced a little bit of a simplification there. t squared on h equals 4x. So you're taking the h and the t out of this equation and now you've just got this x there. Um, and he created this Lewis form factor. And Lewis form factor is lowercase y. Uh, and if you choose that form factor to be 2x on 3p where t is the circular pitch and throw the y in that equation, then if you can get what y is, then you can get what stress is. Okay? So that y is just a relationship to the ratio of height to width of tooth. And as we have standardised height and width ratios for teeth, then we can get y. And if you look at your gear handout, I've put it in just for this conversation, but we don't actually really care about it from effectively after this slide on. Figure 15.21 is values of Lewis form factor y for standard spur gears. Along the horizontal, you have number of teeth. Uh, each one of those lines is for a different contact angle of the teeth. I told you that 20 degrees is our most common, but 25 is not uncommon. Um, and so, based on the number of teeth, and then the, um, the contact angle, you can work out what your Lewis form factor is. Throw that into the equation, and if you have P and you have FT, then you have C. Good, easy enough. Um, and so it's, it's just a bending calculation, but it's the bending calculation for generalised teeth, and now you don't have to go out there with a bending caliber and work out what size your teeth are. You just need to know how many teeth it is, and, and 
that it adheres to standard two geometries. Um, and if you want to replace the uh, lowercase p, which was our whatever the, the pitch was with an actual diametral pitch, which is uppercase p or module, you can just do that by rearranging based on what we know about the relationship of that. Yeah. And so that's how, technically that's how we get uppercase y, which is what is in this table. So that lowercase y converted into an uppercase y with diametral pitch is what we've got here. Okay? So Ft, uppercase P, which is your diametral pitch, divided by B and Y, and we get the different Lewis form factors. Okay? Uh, and this is just exactly the same except uh, with um, module, module sorry, instead of diametral pitch. Cool? So, if you wanted to calculate the Lewis stress on a gear tooth, which is just the simplest stress you can calculate with that graph, and these two equations, you now have an equation for stress. It's effectively just the bending stress of a beam sticking up with a force on it. Everyone on board with that? All right. We're going to get a bit more complicated because obviously gear teeth aren't perfect uh, and there are different things that affect the gear teeth. Uh, what's the biggest, most glaringly obvious thing we're missing in this equation? Let's just look here. This is just assuming that this is a perfect beam. And what have we got here? Good radius. And so we've got stress concentration. And we will have stress concentration on top of that, among other things. So we need to get a little bit more complicated before we go anyway. Cool. And so this is what we do. We have a refined analysis, uh, which is uh, a modification of the loose. All right, um, it's a little bit different. Um, and we're modified to this. Still FT, still diametral pitch like we had, or module on the bottom if, uh, if you're in SI units. B, now we have this J, and what the hell is J? Don't know, we'll talk about it in a minute. KB, KR, and KM. All right, and so now if we can get J, KB, KR, and KM, then we can get stress. Um, and those things all relate to various um, changes in gears. All right, the first thing, J. It is a geometry factor that this time, rather than just using Y, which is your Lewis form factor, it actually incorporates the stress concentration factor. All right, because that fillet radius is standardised exactly the same as the ratio between height and width of the tooth is standardised if you have standard gear T. Um, remember all those standardised relationships I gave you yesterday. So it doesn't make sense to then go and calculate a completely different thing for a standard geometry and add that to a different thing for a standard geometry. Just combine it into one fact that makes everyone life easy. Uh, and that's exactly what we have if you get your table 15.23 in your textbook or on the graph there. Uh, that will give you the geometry factor J. And the way you work that out is the bottom line there is load applied at the tip of the tooth, no sharing. So that just assumes that you're just loading up one single tooth, like what we said. Uh, but if you have load sharing, so sharing over two teeth, they've actually allowed us to get a little bit more conservative, a little bit more complicated by having load sharing versions. And that assumes that that load is shared over two teeth. All right, so the, the most critical stress that occurs if you have load sharing over two teeth. Um, and so we have number of teeth along the horizontal and each one of those lines is the number of uh, mating teeth. Um, and the teeth that you're interested in analysing, the teeth on the gear that you're calculating the stress for, that's along the horizontal. And the teeth that that's mating with is along these, the different lines. Right, and those different lines. So if I'm calculating the teeth for a, for a gear and I've got a pinion up here, then if I use that gear on the horizontal, if that's got 40 teeth and I've got a pinion with less 17 or whatever, then that's my stress. Whereas if I want to know the gear stress on the pinion, then I use 17 along this horizontal and then 40 on the line. You should get fairly close anyway. Um, but the gear you're interested in is the one on the horizontal. Okay, everyone good with that? Um, and the two plots, one for 20 degrees contact angle and one for 25 degrees. All right, so if you have a different contact angle than that, you'll need to go and find a different table for that J factor. 
Every bit with what day is it? Easy enough to find it, you just read it off the table. Cool. Alright, KB, velocity or dynamic factor. Um, and so that's sort of functional on impact. Alright, and so gears that mesh really, really smoothly won't have those sort of impact or impulse type loads. Uh, and it's functional on how the gears have been made, so how accurate was the manufacturing process, and how fast are the gears going. So the faster those gears go, if you have a tiny, tiny, tiny little difference, when the gears are going slow, that's not going to cause a lot of gear chatter. But if they're going really, really quick, the smaller, the quicker they go, the smaller the difference has a big effect. Okay, and so. In those manufacturing processes, if you have those impulse loading and the chattering in the gear tooth, you'll get that, that impact and that will cause, it can cause quite a considerable influx or increase in, in the stress. Uh, and so figure 1524, those are your lines. And the velocity factor, each one of those lines associates with a different manufacturing process. You can see the lowest down one is highest precision, shaved and ground. So this is, you are Ford Motor Company and you are producing a million of these things. You want that to be spot on. And look at the effect that that has. Anywhere between a factor of one and a factor of, it's going really quick, point, you know, 1.5, so an extra 50%. Let's just see how that acts. So if that's one, that means it has no effect and the stress stays the same. If that's 1.5, then you're increasing the stress by 50%. All right. Now, if we go to high precision shape the ground, that's anywhere between sort of yeah that 0.5 and up to sorry 1.5 and up to about two. Pre precision shape the ground goes a little bit higher, and then Hobbs shaping cutters and Hobbs prong cutters. So Hobbs operation is a standard type operation that you might have um, for uh, a fit, fitting for your mill or something like that. So that's the sort of thing you can do in a workshop without any post manufacturing processes. All right. So if you're going to cut a gear, you're probably doing it with some sort of Hobbs cut. Um, and so if you're, you're specifying the manufacturing, then you're probably somewhere in those two lines. And if you do a shit job of it and it's still only going 2,000 RPM, you just increase the stress, well, the fact is 4.5. So that's an incredibly large increase in stress just based on these, those impulse loads, and that's purely because of the manufacturing processes. Okay, So um, that's sort of the difference between you buying off-the-shelf gears and you making the gears yourself. It can have a huge difference on the stress, um, unless you've got all of those post-production um, facilities. Uh, in this subject, I think most of the time we'll say a top quality hobbing operation is something very common, which will just be the very, very best line out of the three lines that are associated with hobs. Okay? And you can either read it straight off that graph, or conveniently, there are the equations to those lines immediately below it. So if you have the V, so that's the pitch line velocity that we calculated yesterday, you can just sub it into one of those equations, and those equations are the line A, B, C, D, and E. Okay, so a top quality hobbing operation would be line C. Very good with that? Cool. Manufacturing makes a big difference to stress, and those impulse loads make a big difference to the stress. Alright, KO, overload factor. What is the likelihood that your machine is going to actually cause some sort of overload in the gear stress? How is everyone in terms of driving? Who's a complete moon? Who's a complete granny? Who's somewhere in the middle? Alright, that's what we're talking about when we talk about overload. So you can hand a brand new car to someone that will really look after it, maintain it, drive it really nicely all the time, and then that stress on the gear teeth won't be you know, too bad, it'll be quite good. You can hand it to someone that loves just spinning it up to 6,000 RPM and dropping the clutch. That's gonna have a lot more effect on your gears, right? Um, and that's what we mean by overload factor. And there's two different two different ends of that spectrum. So driven end, so your driven machinery, is there impulse loads in it? 
And if you're a hermit and you like spinning up to five or six thousand RPM and dropping a clutch, that is definitely an impulse load on that driven end of the, the machine. Uh, the driving end of the machine, sorry. The driven end is what's actually happening at the other, other side. So that might be, you know, whatever's driving, if there's impulse loads on, on where the power is going. In the car, I suppose that might be including, um, you can get different loads on wheels and things like that, so it certainly wouldn't be perfectly smooth. If you've got a conveyor that's just constantly going, that's nice and smooth. If you've got a conveyor that gets, you know, big bits of ore dumped on it, and so there's a big load, and now there's no load, there's a big load again, then that starts to be impulse on the, on the actual driven end. Um, if you look at your table, Table 15.1, <coughs> overload correction factor. So down the left there, you got sources of power. So that's your, your motors, your engine, are you a moon, are you not? Is someone driving the crane like this or is someone driving the crane very carefully? Are they well trained? Are they shit trained? Are they a bit of a yahoo? So um, source of power, uniform, light shock or medium shock. Um, if it's heavy shock, then you can actually, you're going to have to do the calculation on that. It's not something you can just do. With the table. And then the driven machinery, what are you doing? You either got uniform, moderate shock, or heavy shock. So you just need to make a bit of a, a judgment on that. But if you've got medium shock at one end and heavy shock at the other end, you've got 2.25. So just in that, that shocking load, um, 2.25, you're increasing the stress by. Okay. Cool. All right, last thing, mounting factors, and that relates to the accuracy of the alignment. Um, and there's a lot of time and money spent on aligning rotating components and gearboxes are no different. Has anyone ever seen what it takes to align? Let's say you've got a new big compressor and you're aligning that with a big gearbox in, uh, in a mine or something like that. You've got two shafts and a couple of flanges and you're coupling them together. Has anyone seen what it actually takes to align those together? So when I did my back crack, I did it out at q and I spent about half my time with Shell Services doing that type of stuff and vibration analysis. And what you get is two, two sensors on each of the shaft, because the shaft have to rotate perfectly aligned, because if they're a little bit off skew, then that's actually going to be putting all that load through the bearings and you'll wear them out completely. All right, so to get them lined up, when you actually bolt them together, you have a laser sensor on the rotation of this side, a laser sensor on the rotation of that side, and a whole bunch of computer systems that will tell you how far out of alignment they are. And then you have to get all the trades guys lifting the gear up, and you put these tiny little shims under each of the four legs until you bring it up or down to the perfect amount of alignment, and then you bolt up the machinery. So that happens with literally every component that rotates that needs to be bolted to a different component that rotates uh, for big applications. You need a guy, generally an engineer, um, with the ability to go and do that. And gears are exactly the same. So when those gears mesh, it's just not, it's not a matter of just putting some bearings in and getting them to go. You need to actually make sure that they work perfectly. And all the tolerance you specify and where the bearings go and the tolerance on where the centre of the bore for the bearing and things like that, all of that has to dictate the actual accuracy of those gear meshes. Because this mounting factor, if you have inaccurate bearings, if you look at your table, down the left-hand side, we've got accurate mounting, small bearing clearances, minimum deflection, and precision gears. So that speaks to both the shafts being in perfect alignment with one another, and the gears touching each other perfectly, they're not being any gaps between the gears. So all of that's done right. And different face widths, widths in inches, the wider they go, the larger the factor, because the wider they are, the more likely it is to be important. Um, because you know, a wide gear is much harder to get lined up than a narrow gear. If they're really good and you've got a wide gear, that's still about one point. But if you've got less rigid mountings, less accurate gears, contact across the full face, it goes up to 2.2. And if you have accuracy and mounting such that less than full face contact exists, it's not even going to give you a number. It's going to say somewhere over 2.2, you're on your own. All right, so that has a really big effect on the stress. And when you're designing one of these things, you've got to have real, take real care in terms of the tolerances of all of where the shaft goes and how big are the gears and all that kind of stuff to make sure that that doesn't have an effect. 
And by the time you've got all of those things, you've got straps. Cool. It's really easy. It's just four, four things to read off the table as far as this subject goes. Um, and then what is FT, which you calculated yesterday? Uh, what is the dimensional pitch, which you'll be given? And what is the width of the tooth, which you'll be given? So calculating stress is very, very easy for gear team. Cool. All right, last thing. Fatigue. If we have <coughs> a driving or a driven gear, Obviously that thing's going around, it's only meshing with uh, whatever it's meshing with once and it's meshing in the same direction every single time. So each tooth on this gear will have no load, no load, no load, no load, no load, heaps of load, no load, no load, no load, again. Okay? That's its life. And so it looks like this. Nothing, something, nothing, nothing, something, nothing, nothing, something, and so forth. Um, so that FT theoretically is a zero-based fatigue loading. All right, and we could, if we had ANSYS and strain gauge data, model exactly that. Um, you could, if you wanted to, do an analysis using the minus rule and the part of the textbook in chapter eight that allows you to do that. What we're going to do is the very easy and probably conservative way of doing it, which is just say that's the same as having a sine curve that just sits there and goes between that maximum and that minimum, okay? So we're just going to treat that the same way that we've treated any zero-based fatigue thus far. Um, if you have an idler gear, and an idler gear is any gear that doesn't actually have uh, you know, either driven or driving machinery attached to it, so it's just either changing a ratio or moving something further over or changing a direction or something like that. Um, in that case, this tooth, if we're saying, uh, let's say clockwise is positive, so that tooth is getting a force, if that's driving it, getting a force anti-clockwise, and then comes around and puts the force on that, and, oh hang on, sorry, force that way down, and that comes around and it pushes there and that's back, okay? So force down, force back, force down, force back. And so what we're actually getting is one way, the other way, one way, the other way, like that on the tooth, relative to the tooth. Okay? And so that's zero base loading. Uh, and once again, we just approximate that with a sine curve, or, you know, sort of the circle curve, I suppose. Um, and so out of those three gears, if they're all the same size and all the same situations, obviously the idle gear is going to be the more critical because it's zero base and you're going between the same number as, sorry, it's, it's sort of soil and it's uh, zero mean. Amplitude is much, much higher than the one on the left. Cool? So we analyze that. Uh, if it was ambiguous, you might analyze each of them. Okay? Alright. AM diagram. Use it exactly the same as what we've used thus far. You calculate, you've got SC here, the ZN, the same thing. Um, SUT and SY for the material of the gear. Um, and then there's two circumstances. One, an idler gear is fully reversed. And remember that fully reversed is sigma m is zero and sigma a is something. So that travels straight up this line and wherever that intercepts, that's our failure point. Um, a driving and driven gear being zero based and anything that's between zero and something, remember that the slope of that line is 45 degrees. So that travels up at a 45 degree and then hits the intercept. So once again, pretty easy sort of things to calculate. Um, you can get more complicated gears. Um, so either gears that might have three gears running on it, um, you can get internal and external gears and all of that kind of planetary gears and, and lots of other complicated circumstances that you guys will actually have to use your brains for. Um, but for the really easy stuff, um, so driving driven and idler gears, this is where we're, where we're sitting. That's as complicated as this subject's going to get anyway. Alright, endurance of it. Again, SE I used to call it SN now, textbook users, so that's what we're using. Um, SN dash is half SUT, easy enough. Endurance limit modifying factors, uh, size factor, uh, four gears, you got a diametral pitch greater than five, you use one, diametral pitch less than five, you use 0.85. And as the diametral pitch decreases, it means bigger, because of the way that that works. Um, so 0.85 for, for that, so you just use a straight criteria on there. 
CB is your surface factor and that's for the finish at the tooth fillet because that's where our critical stress is um, and that will speak to your manufacturing process that we've already discussed here as well. All right, um, and so if you have like a Hobbs operation, that's the machining, so you can probably choose the machine line. Um, if you were to have uh, something a little bit more high quality, ground, etc., then you can use those lines, but just be rational about that. Um, there's an argument to be made that if you're already including that on the stress side, you might not need it on this side. Um, that's up to you, um, but in this subject we will do it on both sides because um, I don't have a clear understanding of... I think this these machining curves is to do with the actual misalignment of the gears and the chattering, whereas that is to do with the roughness and the stress concentration that results from that roughness. So they're two different, in my view, they're two different parameters and so we use both of them. Um, but um, just be rational when you use those in practice um, and if you're getting numbers that are massive, maybe rationalise back a little bit of that stress concentration or whatever. We good with that? Yeah? Cool. Um, CC is temperature factor, exactly the same. CD is reliability, exactly the same. as CE is miscellaneous, exactly the same. Okay, so stuff you've already done under control. Alright, and so that's everything you need to know about gear team. Stress analysis. Pretty easy. Um, it seems pretty easy because you guys have done it like 18,000 times now. Um, it's exactly the same process, it's just a slightly, you know, you calculate F a bit different and you have a bit different equation for stress, but it's exactly the same procedure. And everything you do in mechanical engineering should effectively follow that same procedure. You just have a slightly different stress equation and a slightly different you know, way of calculating the forces and thinking about the machine component. But you guys are now mechanical engineers. Um, this is the fundamental stuff that you need to know and it's not getting more complicated than this. It just gets more complicated machine components and you start needing to use finite elements rather than hand calculations to work out the, the F and the sigma and stuff like that. But, but the actual theory is all, all exactly the same. From here on in, this is your fundamental understanding of mechanical engineering, and you can apply this to every single machine component. Cool. <coughs> Alright, I have an example for you. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to um, like write it up on the board and make you do it or something. I might just flow through the PDF quickly, and then you guys can have a proper look at this over the weekend, and then we'll have a go at it on Monday. Okay, but I don't want to just throw you at a chute without having shown you an actual work problem in this. So we'll just do it quickly and then, then we can go. Yeah. Alright, that's the problem, right? So, really easy problem. You've got a pinion has 20 teeth. 1100 RPM, and you've got a gear that has 40 teeth. Um, they're spur gears. You have a yield and an ultimate tensile strength, which is in KSI, so we're working in English units. Gears tend to be a little bit more commonly English units. Um, you deal with horsepower a lot in gear trains. Um, a lot of geared systems are manufactured in the US. Um, other ones in Germany are generally SI, but a lot of the stuff you'll be dealing with is US based stuff, so it's, uh, it's much more common to be in English units. Um, and the gear drives a blower, uh, and so you have a motor on the pinion there. Um, standard full depth teeth, uh, accurate mountings, dimensional pitch is 8, uh, contact angle 20 degrees, 1 inch thick, um, and it gives you some information, accurate mountings, and a top quality hopping operation. So that just speaks to those parameters we were talking about before. Um, in a question, I will give you all of the information that you need to actually choose which bit of the table. Uh, in reality, you'll need to make that distinction yourself as clever engineers and all. Alright, um, and the most common thing that we'll do with a gear train and what you're asked to do in this question is give it a horsepower rating. So what is the maximum horsepower this gear train can, can transmit um, without shearing the gear teeth off effectively. Alright, um, and we want a factor of safety 1.5 and 99% reliability. Again, I'll just give them to you, otherwise you'll need to choose what they are in whatever circumstance. Alright, here's some assumptions. 
Gears, mesh, along pitch line, along those pitch diameters. So that's that's a common one. Um, we assume that they mesh on the, you know, perfectly tangential, um, those two pitch line diameters kissing, right? If they don't, if they're spread a little bit, then all of that brilliant involute stuff that gears have starts to go to hell. And if they're too close, then you're going to have massive forces pushing together and wearing and having all sorts of problems. So um, that speaks to accurate mounting. Gear two loaders are transmitted at the pitch point, which is again sort of, if it's accurate, that will be the case. Uh, no load sharing, so we're going to assume that you're just sitting on one tooth. We could just as easily say we assume load sharing. Sort of depends on the size of the gears. If you have very, very small gears, chances are it's more likely that they, they just ride on a single tooth. Whereas if you have very, very large gears that are the same size, as that sort of diameter gets greater, with smaller teeth, you've got less of an angle and you've got more teeth meshing with one another. And so it just sort of depends on the size. Um, 20 teeth isn't a particularly big gear, so that seems like a reasonable assumption. Uh, top quality manufacturing results in line on uh, line C. So that was the hopping operation, which line, I just wrote an assumption there to make sure that we, we're clear on it. Uh, and uniform load on the motor and the blower. The blower isn't pushing anything other than air, so it's not very likely that it's, you know, on the, on the driven machinery side, it's not going to be flux, fluctuating. Um, and if it's just a constant blower that's just running, you know, blowing air out, um, if, it's, if it's just running constantly in a plant, then chances are you're not going to be driving the motor up and down and up and down either. So you just be a bit rational about that, but let's assume that it's a nice uniform load on both ends. Now, if you're driving a conveyor or a moving vehicle or a crane or something like that, that might be a different story. All right, so general procedure, what do we know? We've got a bunch of equations. Let's work out how many of those parameters we actually do know. Uh, pinion, we've got a diametral pitch, so, and we've got the T, so we can calculate the diameter very easily, which we do. 2.5 inches. Uh, we want the pitch line velocity at some point. We have an equation for that. If we have diameter and the uh, RPM, which we do, we can calculate that. 719.95 feet per minute. Oh, Billy noticed yesterday, did anyone else notice that I was using, what was I using, feet inches? And in the section 1.9 equation that relates torque and power, the T that goes into that equation is actually pound feet, not pound inches. My bad. Um, so what I did in, uh, in the online version of that, that example from yesterday, I just changed it from a, a hundred pound inches to a hundred pound feet, and then perfect. Okay? So be careful about your units. Very easy to problem. Um, power, FDB on 33000. We've got that, we've got that, we don't have FT, right? And so that's one of our unknowns and we need to get to that. Um, and in any of these horsepower specifications, we get to that based on the allowable stress and the relationship between allowable stress and force, which is our stress equation that we've just done in this lecture. Okay? So that's where we need to go. Which is this, gear tooth stress. We need to know that. We can get all of these things from those tables and then we get this from the AM diagram. Okay? So, pitch is 8, B is 1 inch, J from the figure, no sharing, and 20 T. We can calculate from the table as 0.24, please confirm. Uh, KB is line C of that box cutting one, so that's this table. And if I sub my pitch line velocity into that, I get 1.54, which I should be able to read for, what was it, 11 something or other? 11, 11, yeah, 1100 RPM. So if I got the 1100 RPM and the C line, that's looking a bit more than 1.5, which sounds about right. KO, assume uniform, we already said that. So if I have uniform source of power and a uniform group of machinery, that's one. Uh, and then KM, we have a one inch wide gear, accurate mountings, and so that's the best case scenario of 1.3. Okay, so those are our numbers. Sorry, Dave, where are you getting up here from? That grass says 50 minutes. Just RPM was given originally? Yeah, on that graph it's about 50 minutes. On that graph it's feet per minute? Oh, yeah, well, along the horizontal, sorry. That one. So, V fish line velocity is 
yeah, feet per minute, you're up. So that should be, what are we using, 700? Yeah, yeah, feet per minute is the pitch line velocity. The pitch line velocity goes in that equation. Sorry, I was just reading the horizontal as, as RPM, but it's not, it is feet per minute as well. Yeah, so that's the 700, not the 1100. My bad. Okay. You think you're not like it. Alright, so, um, sum that stuff into that equation, and we get a relationship between stress and FT as 66.73, and that's in PSI. Don't screw PSI and KSI out in the same way as don't screw pascals and megapascals up. Right, so we need our allowable stress. Allowable stress comes from the AN diagram. The only thing we don't know about the AN diagram is our SN or SE, either one. Um, P is greater than 5, so that's 1. Machined, I calculated 0 0.72. Temperature is 1, 99% reliability and miscellaneous is one. So all of the stuff that you should be able to do in your sleep now, hopefully. Um, and I get SE is 37.89, what should be KSI. I'm not sure why that's not written on there. It's kind of corrected itself when I've edited some of this stuff. That should be KSI. All right, both those years only have a single mesh point, which means they will be zero-based fluctuating load, so between zero and something, which gives us a 45 degree line on the AN diagram, and the need to calculate the intercept of that with a 1.5 factor of safety, which is all of this business. And I get FT from that by, uh, we've got the FT equation on the previous one, so sigma A equals sigma M equals sigma on two, which is our 66 0.73 FE, FT, sorry, on 2, sub that in, and I get FT is equal to 585.5 pounds. If I know FT, I can sum it back in my power equation, and once I do that, the maximum horsepower that my gear train can put out with a factor safety 1.5 and all that other stuff is 12.77 horsepower. Cool? And just to be nice to these engineers, I'd probably round that down to a whole number, but you know, that's up to you. Um, and so what that tells us is if I was now specifying what motor to drive it, I need a motor that will be able to put out 12 horsepower and I need to be able to control that. So I go and buy a 12 horsepower motor. Or if you can't get a 12 horsepower motor, maybe I'll go to 10 or whatever the, the lower side of that is that can then put out the power to drive it. Uh, whatever the driven machinery is. Um, and if I need more power, it tells me that I need to have a better gearbox or stronger gearbox or whatever. Cool, makes sense? Right, that'll be online and then you guys will have a real, real crack at it.